Yes, welcome to the Biz Communication Show. I'm your host, Bill Lampton, the Biz Communication Guy. Every week hosting an outstanding business communicator so that you and I can learn tips and strategies that will help us boost our business. This week is a very different week for the Biz Communication Show because we are in the midst worldwide of facing the threat of the coronavirus. And that is something that I will not give statistics on as far as infections or deaths because those statistics will change during the next 20 minutes. We have someone who is incredibly qualified to talk to us about dealing with struggles. He's the author of the book, Time to Get Tough, a wonderful book. And so our theme today is going to be let's get tough together. In fact, Michael Coles, I'll give an introduction in a second. Michael Coles told me that he is certainly an internationally known, respected, and desired public speaker. Many public events where he was going to speak have, as we all understand, been canceled for safety's sake. Michael told me that he has a message that he wants to get across to the world during these very testing times. And so I will introduce him now. Michael Coles summarized who he is in his book, Time to Get Tough. He said, my life and career have been about turning obstacles and opportunities, tragedies into triumph and poverty into philanthropy. He certainly did turn poverty into philanthropy. He started working full time at age 13 in the clothing business. Eventually, he founded the Great American Cookie Company. He headed Caribou Coffee and Brand Branch. He never attended college, and yet, amazingly, Kennesaw State University in the Atlanta, Georgia area proudly bears the name the Coles College of Business for one of his divisions. Athletically, he set the record for the Spirit of America ride on his bicycle cross country. We'll talk about that. And with all of his accomplishments, he remains very eager to help us through these very tough times. And so join me now, please, in welcoming Michael Coles to the Biz Communication Show. Hello, Michael. Hello, Bill. So great to be with you. Uh... I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to your listeners. We welcome your being here. One of the key questions I think listeners would have right away is, you've written a book about getting tough and you're asking people to let's get tough together. Let's explore for a couple of minutes what qualifies you to talk about getting tough. Let's start, for example, with your business life. There's a story I remember from the, your founding of the Great American Cookie Company. Tell us about that and especially your opening day. Well, I, real quickly, I mean, we started the company with virtually no money. My partner and I had each put in uh, $4,000, $8,000 total investment. Uh, we, hadn't, we knew nothing about the food business, but we had a concept for doing cookies that was very different than the couple hundred stores that were already in business. And we knew we could be successful if we were given the opportunity. Uh, it was difficult finding a location. And after someone finally took a chance on us to give us a site at Perimeter Mall, uh, showing how little we knew about the business became very evident on that first day when we put our first batch of 300 cookies in the oven and when they were done sitting on their trays beautifully, golden brown, uh, we realized we had forgotten to get oven mitts. And uh, for not forgetting, forgetting oven mitts was unbelievable because it caused the cookies to literally catch fire uh, on their trays and uh, smoke poured out of our oven. The fire department came out, the mall manager, a guy named Jeff Weil, who had taken a big chance on us, could have broken our lease right then and there on our first day, and uh, uh, he didn't. But we literally could have been out of business that first day, and all of the risks that we had taken, signing a quarter of a million dollar 
uh, lease and personally guaranteeing it uh, for a 10 year period and borrowing money where uh, the bank may us again sign personal guarantees. All of that, we literally could have lost everything on that first day. Uh, but again, luckily the mall manager took a big chance on us. We did get open the next day and uh, you know, the, I guess the rest is cookie history. You know, we went from that $8,000 investment, built a hundred million dollar business and eventually sold it uh, in 1998. And I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, this is the 42nd year of the cookie company still in business, still going strong. And one of the great business lessons from that, I would think would be pay attention to every detail. You had everything in place except for those mitts which were necessary to take those hot cookies out of the oven. Well, and you know, that, that is absolutely the, the thing that I talk about a lot when I'm given the opportunity to talk about not only my book, but just get to talk to different audiences. You know, the difference between success and failure is literally what you not plan for. Uh, anybody can deal with the things that they knew would happen, but we literally could have been put out of business because we forgot a $3 set of oven mitts. And so I talk about this a lot. You know, uh, being an entrepreneur, entrepreneur is not about getting knocked down. You're going to get knocked down. You're going to, things are going to happen that you just don't plan for. But it's just a question of the resiliency that you have to keep getting back up. Well, speaking of getting knocked down and getting back up, the business was going well. Six weeks later, tell us about how you got knocked down and personally and what the, the recovery was like on that. Yeah, six weeks after we started the company with everything going really well. I mean, we, had, we didn't have to go begging for locations anymore. People were coming to us and asking us to open stores in their mall. We had people applying uh, for franchises. But six weeks after we started the company, uh, I woke up in Northside Hospital in Atlanta uh, with two doctors basically standing over in my bed telling me I had been involved in a near fatal motorcycle accident and I would probably never walk normally again. I would always need some type of aid, either canes or crutches. And considering the alternative of not waking up at all, I thought that was okay. But about nine months after my accident, I had an incident with my daughter, Taryn, who was three years old at the time that virtually changed my business life and my physical life forever. Daughters uh, can do that for us, can't they? They can, they absolutely can. Yeah, she asked me to race her up the driveway. We had a steep driveway at our house and, um, I figured even on two canes, I could beat this little kid up the driveway. But when I took off to run, the pain was absolutely excruciating. And it was the very first time since my accident that I realized that I was disabled. But it, And then before I could even make an excuse to her, she could see even at three what was going on. And she just looked at me and said, you know, Daddy, I'm really too tired uh, to run up the driveway today. And oh, so, my gosh. What sympathy. It was, it was devastating. And so uh, I began uh, knowing that, like I said, it was the first time since my accident that I realized I was disabled. But it wasn't so much disabled in my legs. It was disabled in my mind. It was the very first time in my life that I had let, ever let anybody tell me what my limits were. But I was living in a safety zone that doctors had given me because I can stand here today or sit here today and tell you that at 33 years old, learning how to walk again really hurts. So I began a self-styled rehabilitation program, started using a stationary bike to get more flexibility in my legs. And uh, as I got more flexibility, I started riding out bike outside, started riding longer and longer distances on a regular bike. And at the same time, we built the cookie company to its national success with hundreds of stores nationwide in sales, as I said, over a hundred million dollars. We not only, I not only learned to walk again, but set three world records riding across the United States on a bicycle. Let's, let's relate that, which I think we can do quite easily to the Corona virus. We have something now which has disabled many people in their minds, not 
many physically, unfortunately, but the rest of us who as yet are not disabled physically, we might be disabled mentally because we feel that we have lost everything or we're going to lose everything. And this is what you really wanted this forum of this interview today to talk about. So let's compare your getting over being disabled in your mind to what steps we can take mentally or even otherwise today dealing with this worldwide threat unlike anything not only that we've seen in our lifetime but world time worldwide in history well yeah you're right bill i mean i i had talks uh, all the way scheduled all the way through september and i actually i thought the september talks would hold but uh, yesterday even those have now been canceled just because people have to buy you know food and reserve hotels and all of that and and really the the reason i wrote my book was not to boast about my career or my success, which uh, I've been very fortunate to have, but it was really to try to help people and motivate them to get out of their safe space and perhaps do more than they thought they could. But these are very, very different times. I mean, I guess my talk, what I would have tried to deliver as a message would have been that the, the reason this is so tough is we don't have a date of when this is gonna be over, or when our lives may go back uh, to what was normal. And in some ways I can relate that to my own personal life and my motorcycle accident, because I had really no way of knowing what, what recovery would look like. Would I ever get back to my physical life in the way it had been prior to my accident? And I'm not trying to make this simple because other people have had much more serious problems than I've had other people had much greater success. But if I could share one thing with your audience, it would simply be this, that I, when I had a rehab, what I had to do for myself was make sure that, you know, I had the big lofty goal of getting my life back and walking the way I had before. But if I had simply had that as the goal, I would have given up because it took so much just to get my legs to bend and be able to, to do the things I had before, that I really had to set a lot of intermediate goals, things that I could reward myself with, that I knew that I was making progress. And I think that what we've got to focus on in this time is we have to try to find, uh, well, while there is no light at the moment, at the end of the tunnel, it's there, we just can't see it yet. And I think what people have to focus on when they listen to the news, is try to find those little points where people are getting better. I mean, it may not be many, but people are getting better. People are taking precautions. And for yourselves, you've got to find a way to live this new norm and take, take it one day at a time and find something each day that can make you feel good. If you, you know, you got to be able to get outside uh, I know it's scary for a lot of people who are living paycheck to paycheck prior to this. Hopefully, uh, some of the stimulus will will land their way and take some of that pressure off. But it, you know, we are lucky today. We have you know we have Facebook and Zoom and other ways to be able to see our family members. I know for me, uh, right now, my, this is the only way I get to see my family, my grandchildren, friends of mine. Uh, but it's still important, even though it's not physically face to face, you got to find those things in your life that can make you feel a little bit better each day. And I encourage people, even if you only get out for five minutes, get outside, walk around, breathe in the air, and just make yourself feel good and know that this is going to end. We will see an end to this, even though we don't have an exact date, but take it one day at a time and look to the day before and know that each day you're you're getting better work you know work out if you can find those things that you've been putting off for a long time and know now you have the time to get a lot of them done so you can feel every day a little bit of a sense of accomplishment i think uh, you make that point so well in your book i I, rem I remember the very paragraph in your book where you said don't set goals that are just too large 
you've got to have, as you just said then, some intermediate steps. I think, for example, of people who uh, maybe late in December make their New Year's resolutions and they say something like, I'm going to lose 50 pounds. Well, that sounds good, but it could get discouraging. What about losing five pounds and then losing 10 more and then losing yeah, five right. more? And eventually by uh, summer or fall, maybe you could reach the 50, but it could get discouraging if right away you say, gee, I didn't, I didn't make the 50. And that I'm sure from your book, I know that's been very important for you in business, achieve what you could at the time. Sure. And, you know, I think that one of the reasons I was able to recover from my accident was in business. I had always set those kind of intermediate goals of what we, were, what we would accomplish uh, each day, each week, each month. And so when I started my rehab, serious rehab program, this kind of self-designed rehab program, when I first got on a bike at the top of my driveway, because I couldn't even ride up my driveway, it was too steep. It was just to get to the end of the block, which was less than a quarter of a mile, and get to the end of the block. And I remember that first day, you know, it's when you're driving in a car, you never realize hills that are either up or down. And when I got on that bike that first time, I couldn't believe how strong I was because I was just flying. And then I realized that my, uh, from the end of my driveway to the end of my street, it was all downhill. And when, <laughs> I, turned, and when I turned around, the reality, you know, hit me. That it was, it was a matter of fact, I couldn't make it back. I had to wind up walking, holding the bike. And it took, you know, a week or so before I was able to do that. And, you know, eventually it was to ride a half a mile and a mile and, you know, eventually 3,000 miles. So, uh, you know, it's just, and I think we've got to kind of do that right now. And there are things you can do every day that, I mean, if there's some things that you wanted to get done and you get that done, you're going to feel a great sense of accomplishment. If there's people that you haven't been able to contact with life steps in and you're very busy and you can make a phone call and talk to someone else and see how they're doing, uh, each day you can make your you can make this new norm uh be something that you can get through and i'm not sitting here trying to minimize how difficult this is this is a very difficult time it's very uncertain uh and but i think you've got to try to keep as positive as you possibly can and i know that i keep saying this get outside even if it's raining take an umbrella walk around you you know communicating in that way and in a way, seeing what, what's bigger around you uh, is so important uh, to get outside. And you can keep your social distance while you're doing that. You can keep that safely, yeah. but get out, enjoy the fresh air, the sunshine, Absolutely. stretching. Those, those walls of your house, no matter how much you love your house, no matter how comfortable and even luxurious it is, that can, that can get pretty tough. And it's, I'm sure it's tough now on parents and children who are together 24 seven for quite a few months. Again, you have to be creative and find ways to make that happen. Another point is that in your book, you talk about the value of teams. And in fact, in the Atlanta Business Chronicle, when you were interviewed there, you said that one of the great joys that you had as a business leader was forming the right teams and helping them accomplish plenty. That's very relevant for us now during the coronavirus. We don't just have to go it alone. And I would imagine that you have seen examples, as I have, of neighbors helping neighbors, of people contributing to organizations when, which they hadn't written checks to before, of people, as you say, getting in contact with others. It's, this is not something we will conquer alone, is it, Michael? No, you, can't, you cannot do it alone. And uh, we're seeing that, you know, in the Atlanta community, and I'm, living, I'm here in Jackson, uh, Wyoming, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and we're seeing uh, an outreach that I, you know, I've never seen anything like it, where people are supporting restaurants by, even if they were normally going to eat home, they're trying to eat out once a week just to support restaurants they used to maybe go to once a week. Now they're ordering out a meal, if not once a week or every other week. 
just just to be able to let them know that they want to help them. And we're seeing, you know, people delivering food to people who can't get out of their house, the grocery stores that I know even in Atlanta, uh, people that are uh, over, over 55 or 60 are being given an opportunity to shop at hours that are earlier than others. I mean, there are a lot, and that's the kind of things I think we need to look at. We need more stories about the positive side of this as opposed to focusing on the negative side of it. And there are good stories every single day. And the one thing, you know, I love some of the social media, but don't believe everything that you see on social media. You know, look to the experts. Don't look to the politicians necessarily to give you the right answer. Listen to what the experts are saying, the scientists who can really talk you through this and let you know what you need to protect yourself and your family. And again, there is light at the end of this. This is going to be behind us. And the old saying, this too shall pass. We can't end, and we will need to in a couple of minutes, but we can't end without your talking about your record-setting bike ride from Savannah, Georgia to San Diego. And there's a wonderful lesson there in your record-setting third ride. I was reading it again just yesterday in your book, about five more miles. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I had heard about these incidents that happen with people where something from their past, uh, suddenly they wake up and they're like, oh my gosh, I remember that. And I always thought that was good television, but never really thought it really happened. And when I wrote my book, um, I had one of those moments. Uh, my co-author, co uh, Catherine Lewis and I, had finally completed the final edits and we sent the book off uh, to our publisher. And I woke up at three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning with where I thought I had been dreaming and I had actually been awake. And I remembered something that happened during that third crossing of America that I honestly had not remembered. And it was that uh, all across the country, my crew, and I had a 12 person support crew and I had a media uh, van following me. I had a, a documentary crew following me. Again, um, showing the value of teams. It was not just an individual effort. Exactly, oh yeah, exactly. But they had done such a great job in every major city of getting me a police escort. But when uh, my third crossing, when I had horrible, horrible headwinds all the way across the country to the point when I got to California, the winds were up to 70 miles an hour. And in my documentary, which people can see at uh, my, Michael Cole's uh, bicycle on, on YouTube, you can see these 70 mile an hour winds that were so horrific that you could not stay upright on the bike. I had to literally get off the bike and walk. And when, so when I, got the, when I got to California, my crew didn't know when or if I was going to make it to San Diego. And so they couldn't get me a police escort. And so um, my crew very wisely got a friend of mine, a guy named Dave Johnson, who had come out to meet me and was going to ride the last 25 sorry, some odd miles in with me behind the police escort. Uh, they got him to find the fastest, shortest route to get me to the courthouse. And so at that turn off the interstate, uh, Dave and I were left with a few water bottles and we we're going to go the last five miles uh, to the courthouse. And when we did that, everybody left, the media van left, the documentary crew left, my regular crew left. And when we got to the first traffic light, it was the first time in 11 days that I had a stop and it was not under my control. I had only slept 22 hours in 11 days and my body started to break down. And when I put my foot down, I felt my right leg start to cramp. And I, my first thought was, this is not good. And by the time we got to the second red light, which was maybe a few more blocks, I could literally feel myself breaking down. I just had nothing left and turned to Dave and just said, I'm not going to make it. That Here close I, to it. That close to it. That close. I was probably at that point four and a half miles away. And all I wanted to do is just go to sleep for a few minutes. And, and uh, you know, through Dave's help and encouragement, he said, well, why don't we try to ride to the next light? And so I did that. And then it was ride to a telephone pole or ride to a street light. These little small 
goals after all these thousands of miles, these little tiny goals. And then I made a right turn on Broadway, which was the main road uh, to get to the courthouse. People knew I was coming. And so there were people on the streets clapping and the adrenaline kicked in. And I got to the courthouse. I held my bike up in the air. I broke my record by over four days. And I did not remember any of those five miles until that morning when I woke up uh, after writing this book. And what I had realized, Bill, this is so important, is, is that everything I had done in my life since the May of 1984, all the decisions I had made regarding business and my personal life, all came out of those last five miles that I didn't realize I had remembered, but that I had remembered it in my subconscious. And the lesson was that you've got to finish the last five miles. It doesn't matter how many thousands of miles you put in. It doesn't matter if you're working on a project, how many weeks or months you work on a project that's not going your way. You've got to be able to finish those last five miles on the project or actually a cross country bike ride. Because if you don't finish the last five miles, you'll never prepare yourself for the next five miles. And that has guided me all these many years. Wonderful lesson. And we could apply that to the coronavirus. We've got right. to see it through to the end. That's right. As yes. tough as it is, we can, and you know what, Bill, we can learn a lot about ourselves. We can learn a lot of, you know, things are going to be different going forward. Businesses are going to learn from this, how they can operate differently, maybe even more efficiently. Maybe they'll need that extra thousand or 2000 square feet of office space because they've now learned that their workers can be very productive working in, in a different environment, working from home. We're gonna learn about grocery delivery in a way that we never thought about it before. We're gonna learn all kinds of things through this process and we'll, we'll wind up probably with a better world after this. You're a lifelong optimist and thank you for sharing that optimism with us. Michael, I know that our viewers and listeners would love to be in contact with you. So please give your contact information. Well, the best way to reach me is uh, through my website, which is just simply michaelcoles.com. Uh, and uh, you, there's a, a way to contact me through that website. Uh, and also, uh, as I said, the documentary, which I, I posted recently to a lot of my social media, uh, can be found on YouTube at uh, Michael Cole's Bicycle. Uh, and it's a documentary, very proud, Rocky Blyer, who is one of my heroes, uh, narrates it. And it's great for families and kids to just kind of see. And again, I'm not trying to make myself into somebody that is more important than I am. I know people have suffered a lot worse things than I have, but you know what? A good story is still a good story and overcoming adversity is, is still something that people need to look at and understand that it can be done. You overcame many odds and I encourage people to get your book, Time to Get Tough. I was fortunate to be one of the early reviewers of the book and I encourage you to go to YouTube and watch Michael Cole's record setting race documentary. That's a wonderful documentary. And Michael, since you've given your contact information, I'll give mine, Bill Lampton, the biz communication guy. And so logically, my website is biz, B-I-Z, bizcommunicationguy.com. Invite you to check my services for corporations and leaders and get in touch with me. Look forward to helping solve your communication problems. Any closing thoughts, Michael? Well, you know, when I was uh, uh, 10 years old, my dad went bankrupt. And um, I didn't realize the extent of the bankruptcy until I was about 13, because my dad uh, continued to overspend, even though we had lost our house and I lost my dog. Uh, everything felt fairly normal because we still had all of our furniture. But when I was 13, my dad always thought he'd recover and didn't. And we had to move to Florida, which was a debtor state. His wages wouldn't be garnished anymore. And we wound up moving into a less than 300 square foot apartment uh, with one bedroom. My parents had to sleep on a porch. And it was a reality check for me because now I really began to understand what bankruptcy was. And I got up that morning after we arrived in Florida 
and I had two choices. One was to think that my dad, in fact, would recover and things would go back to normal, or I could take on the responsibility to help my family and get a job. And at 13, that was the decision I made. I wasn't happy about it. Uh, it was not heroic. Uh, I knew making that decision would meant my teen years were going to be a lot different than I had anticipated. But I had a family responsibility, and I felt like I needed to do it. And I needed, at that moment, a story of overcoming adversity. And I looked to the story of David and Goliath, where this small man walks into the valley and takes on this enormous giant who has weapons and armor. And David has nothing more than a slingshot and a few stones. And most of us know the moral to the story is that not only did David win the battle against the giant, but actually killed the giant. But for me, that was never the that was never the outcome for me. The outcome for me in that story was that David had the courage to step in to the valley without knowing what the outcome would be. And I think in these times now, it's a wonderful story and message for all of us because we're all facing Goliath challenges uh, these days. And we've got to find a way. I normally would give a lot of examples, but we don't need any more examples other than what we're facing today. So try to find a little sunshine uh, in, in all of this so you can give yourself the courage to take that first step and walk into the valley. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for having me on. Thank you very much, Michael Coles. I know that all of us benefited from your wonderful story of how you have overcome adversity and how during, during one of the most testing, trying times in the world, wherever we live, we can do the same. And thanks to those of you who joined us today. Look forward to hosting you again next week on the Biz Communication Show. I'm Bill Lampton, your host.